Well, welcome to episode 13 of 10 Minute Record Reviews, and Lucky 13 is Ravi Shankar's album recorded in London. Uh, this is the, uh, this is the um, uh, 1963 USA release on World Pacific. The official release was actually a year earlier in the UK in 1962, um, although there's some other pressings kicking around from 1961. But this is the release which gets listened to a lot in the United States in the early 1960s and ends up being enormously influential, uh, which and we'll talk about the, that later in the review. So, what can you expect from this record? Well, this is Indian classical music. This is this is Ravi Shankar, uh, accompanied on, on sitar, uh, accompanied by uh, two other musicians, one on tambour and one on tabla drums. Um, it's uh, it is said of uh, the Velvet Underground's uh, debut that only uh, two hundred people bought the album, but they all started the band. Um, this is uh, much the same can be said of this. Maybe not that many people originally heard this album, but they all bought a sitar. I'm sure you must have been asked this lots of times before, but uh, uh, what's your opinion of um, sort of English pop groups, the American pop groups, using sitar and the, and the uh, Indian influence in their records? Well, I'm afraid that uh, this, this sudden interest that there seems to be now might go away as suddenly but on the other hand it makes me it will make me very happy if I see that uh, some people take true interest and learn properly mm. because after having played the sitar for 36 years I feel that one has to give some time to it <laughs> indeed <laughs> how far back does the sitar date well sitar has been popular for nearly 700 years in India mm. and uh, how, how was it sort of uh, was it like that when it was first built? Or no, it is derived from a very old instrument known as the veena. Mm. Yes, I see. Even if the groups got very good on the sitar, do you think it would last or is it just one big gimmick? Well, I personally think it might be just, you know, it's the new sound which has interested many people. How long do you think it will last as far as pop goes? Well, as it has been always the case with uh, new sounds in pop, comes and goes new things maybe it will be the Japanese koto tomorrow <laughs> so this album was released on on World Pacific Records which was previously known as, as Pacific Jazz and, and it's an interesting little label actually it's a diversion on them so they're originally best known for that offshoot of of, uh, of uh, bop in the in the post bebop era called cool jazz so this is where you had largely white musicians uh, who was started up a scene in San Francisco some of whom have been demobbed for the military others Others uh, were not. Um, almost all of them seem to go on to have some kind of complicated relationship with heroin, um, but not all of them. Um, so we're talking about people like Chet Baker, Jerry Mulligan, Joe Pass, Bud Shank, Lee Konitz, uh, you know, really seminal figures in the development of, uh, of post-war American jazz. Um, and, uh, and, and Pacific Jazz was the label that, that, that brought these artists uh, um, uh, into the foreground. Um, then the label began to branch out, and one of the ways they branched out was uh, was to and, and when I say they, Richard Bach, who was the, you know the main impresario behind the label, uh, was to was to introduce Ravi Shankar to Western musicians. So people who listened to this record uh, included included the Birds, who then met the Beatles shortly thereafter, when the Birds were touring the UK, um, and this you know passed on, you know, this record and, 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 and their impressions of Shankar to, you know, to George Harrison, of course, to Brian Jones, the Stones as well. So you make a pretty good argument that, that you know, without this album, you don't get Norwegian Wood, you don't get Love You Too, uh, you don't get Within You Without You, uh, you don't get Blue Jay Way, which is, which is very much uh, you know, based on Indian progressions, even though it's, it's all Western instrumentation. You don't get Painted Black, at least not the way it was, it was recorded. So um, enormously influential um, as an album in ways that I'm sure startled Shankar, uh, but uh, but you know he wasn't gonna he wasn't gonna fight it. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about the about you know the specifics of of the of the musical forms that are on here. There there there's two ragas and one and one doing here, uh, but that's about as deep as I can go. I'm no expert in Indian classical music. Um, there is quite. Interestingly, almost kind of amusingly, if you look on the so I can, if you look on the back of the album, uh, you can see that there is um, uh, there is uh, uh, quite a list of um, 
uh, of, uh, or listing of technical terms and basically almost a sort of didactic sort of instructional uh, uh, a set of information in the back. Probably quite handy for, um, uh, you know, given who the audience actually was, Westerners who had really not experienced this kind of music before. It's really well produced by Richard Bach, again, the, the, the label uh, owner, but also the, the principal producer for most of the records. It's got really nice, crisp sound. Um, uh, Shankar's playing, to the extent that, you know, that I'm able to comment on, on whether or not people are good sitar players. My impression certainly is he's, he's a very nimble and exceptional player. Um, two other, there's two other uh, musicians which I mentioned. There's, there's Ken I Dutu plays the tabla, which is the, which is the drums, and, and, and Nodu Moluk on tambora. The tambora is another Indian string instrument, if, if you're unaware, uh, which which typically produces a, a droning sound, very typical of Indian classical music. It produces a drone against which the sitar um, can play. Uh, and, you know, sort of linking um, uh, in, in, I guess, what we would call sort of a scale sense against the, uh, against the, uh, against that drone. It's, that, because that, so, that tone is so typical of, because that tone is so typical of Indian classical music, the tambora is often mistaken uh, for a sitar when people hear it, but it's a distinct instrument and is almost always paired uh, with the sitar. Um, as I said, I can't say too much about Indian classical music, uh, except to say that, you know, if I'm going to draw a parallel to jazz, which I know a little bit more about, uh, it seems to me that it has a fair amount in common with the modal jazz playing of the 1960s, uh, just, you know, in terms of, in terms of often working off um, one very restricted set of, uh, of, I guess, you know, available, available notes and, and uh, you know, off, you know, within the boundaries of one Western chord, although, of course, the, the, uh, there's not, there's no Western chord structure being employed here. I'm not the only person to have pointed that out, too. So in terms of the music on this album, there are three pieces, and side one's got two of them. There's Raga Hamsadwani, which is a South Indian Raga, apparently, and then, and which is, which is kind of, uh, sort of a medium tempo uh, piece. Uh, then there's Dun Kafi, which is a second song on side one, um, has some much Quicker soloing by 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 Shankar. Really, it's it's really quite impressive. Uh, I have to say to listen to, um, and then side two, which to me is the is is by far the more interesting of the two sides, is is a Raga Ramkali, and it's and it, it occupies the full side of the album. It, I gather from having read about this record uh, to some degree that that this is basically a a, a distillation of what would normally be a two or three hour concert which Shankar would give but he, so all the elements that would go into a concert uh, are, uh, are are packed into basically 20 minutes here or, or slightly less um, it's so it's a condensed version of a concert it's it's and it has and it's quite dynamic it's beautifully mellow to start um, and the pace picks up very gradually very careful carefully and and at the end you have a real crescendo and really quite intense playing at the end um, uh, it's 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 quite a trip, and you and you hear that, and you can see how you know Western folk musicians and rock musicians' minds were blown by you know by the by not just the quality of the music, but by the potential, um, you know, sort of the you know the the sort of expanding horizon of what was possible. So, what to say about this album overall? Um, it's it's a beautiful record to listen to. Uh, the playing I find really quite hypnotic. It it's. It's a it's an album that really demands to be listened to attentively. There's even there are just three instruments here, but the different modes they move through, and I'm not using modes in the technical sense, just in kind of a lay sense here, uh, constantly keep the music interesting. Um, Shankar's focus is 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 really intense here and and, and amazing. It's, it reminds me a little bit of uh, Paco de Lucia, the, the the great guitarist. So this is this is both an essential. I would argue, and a significant record. This is a record which which turns Western pop music uh, in a completely different direction, or or at least, and and opens its opens the possibility of 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 many different sounds, uh, and 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 is in part responsible for uh, for the psychedelia which is to follow. It's a gateway to a pretty major fusion movement, and you can still hear those echoes today. Uh, so I give this five stars uh, because it's amazing music. I think it's essential and, and give it a spin.